The president of Harvard University has fallen, and it marks a fascinating development for the higher education frontier of the culture war. The beginning of the end for President Claudine Gay started on October the 7th, 2023, when Hamas launched a terrorist attack on Israel, killing more than 1,200 people. With blood still wet on Israeli soil, the Harvard Undergraduate Palestine Solidarity Committee authored a statement, co-signed by 33 other Harvard student groups, stating, We, the undersigned student organizations, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. A fierce media backlash ensued as pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian demonstrations erupted on campuses around the world. On November 29th, a Title IX investigation was launched by the US Department of Education into anti-Semitism and Islamophobia on campuses. A few days later, Claudine Gay was pulled in front of the US Congress with two other elite college presidents, Sally Kornbluth of MIT and Elizabeth McGill from UPenn. It didn't go well. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? It depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. Further fury exploded on social media, and high-profile Jewish donors began to pull their funding and demand resignations. It should not be hard to condemn genocide. Scenting injured prey, conservative activists began to circle Claudine Gay. They dug up old accusations of plagiarism and started trawling through her academic work. In response, left-leaning mainstream media outlets and the Harvard Corporation took up defensive positions around Gay. In this tumultuous and difficult time, we unanimously stand in support of President Gay, said Harvard's board in a statement on December 12th. With regard to President Gay's academic writings, the university became aware in late October of allegations regarding three articles. The fellows promptly initiated an independent review, which revealed a few instances of inadequate citation, while analysis found no violation of Harvard standards for research misconduct. The following week, a conservative media outlet called the Washington Free Beacon submitted an anonymous complaint to Harvard's integrity office with evidence of 40 instances of plagiarism. We launched the Claudine Gay plagiarism story from the right, the next step is to smuggle it into the media apparatus of the left, legitimizing the narrative to center-left actors who have the power to topple her, then squeeze," tweeted conservative activist Christopher Rufo. As promised, they wore left-leaning media organizations down by creating a lot of interest in the story and circulating a preponderance of evidence of gays' plagiarism, until finally the entire mainstream media machine began to tilt against gay. On the 2nd of January, 2024, Claudine Gay resigned as president of Harvard University. As it is with every major event within the culture war, the discourse is now spinning off in every conceivable direction. But what I'm trying to do here is to cut through the noise and draw your attention into the core of this story. And that's that Claudine Gay was purposefully targeted by conservative activists who knew exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it. And the reason for this is that although she might be a mediocre academic, she's a Rembrandt level ideological activist. And for years, she's been aggressively expanding Harvard's diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracy. What's wrong with that? You might be asking. Isn't DEI about inclusive spaces and affirmative action? If you're still asking those kinds of questions, you need to catch up. And that's why I'm here. We've been interested in Mike Nainer's work on how DEI activists have been transforming universities across the Western world since before it went mainstream. Our elite classes, they all go through the academy and they learn these things and then they come out and they produce art, they produce journalism, right. they produce the templates for how we think. And so we live downstream from the academy. So whatever happens there, it will eventually happen within the culture. It'll manifest in some sense. Given the recent Harvard scandal is undoubtedly a sign of things to come, we've invited Mike on the channel to share part one of his brilliant documentary series called The Reformers. It's about an undercover academic sting operation that exposes a dodgy scholarship that legitimizes woke ideology. And it's utterly insane. So without any further ado, enjoy.
Where would you like to be in? Let's start with Peter and James. Okay. Tell me about them. Peter Bogosian is a philosophy professor and James Lindsay is an author with a background in mathematics. They're part of an intellectual movement that has begun pushing back at a problem they see inside the university system. You know, you think, ah, oh, these people are studying racism and sexism, and okay, somebody should be doing that, and good. Then you start looking at it, and they publish some crazy stuff. I mean, crazy stuff. Then you start looking at the methods that they're using, and, and there's no method. It's just a bunch of opinions people are stringing together, and, and, and they're pretending to be social scientists. These people have manufactured their own corpus of literature, and they publish in these journals, and they use that to credential themselves to sit at the adult table and have conversations that influence public policy, university policy, what an entire generation of students will learn. Microaggressions are real! Microaggressions are real! It's hijacked our institutions. Everybody's petrified of calling this out because they're, they're afraid of being called a bigot or a racist or a homophobe. Well, I'm not afraid. Only a handful of people know about this because one leak destroys the whole thing. One single leak and we're, we're buried. Our goal is to publish as many papers as we can that are unbelievably sophisticated parodies. And we're gonna publish these in tier one journals. So we're trying to go right to the source and say, look, the whole enterprise is bogus. And we're hoping that if we can get to the source and show that the scholarship that everything's coming out of is itself a fraud, nobody has to listen to these people anymore. It's hard to convey to people who are not in this world what an insane idea this is. I mean, literally to delegitimize an entire body of scholarship upon which university architecture is predicated, they give tens of thousands of actual degrees in this stuff. They have professors in this institutes. Do, do you get that? We're going after all of it. by liberal humanist and Marxist scholars, which pointed out that white identity had been formed at the expense of black identity. It is essential to note that critical race theory is originally an American phenomenon, and the evidence that America was a racially divided society with blacks as second-class citizens until very recently is indisputable. However, with its recent descent into postmodern discourse analysis and conceptions of society as entirely underlain by systems of white supremacy operating in mysterious ways, critical race theory has become quite unhinged. It threatens to undo much of the progress that has been made on racial equality. Using methods which assume racism to be present in any interaction between a white person and a person of racial minority results in always finding it and further entrenching the belief in an ever-present white supremacy. A similar pattern has emerged within feminism, where again everything is seen in terms of a hidden system of patriarchy which hides beneath a benign surface. The job of the feminist is to detect it. Going through life in order to direct, uh, detect ways in which men are belittling you is unlikely to lead to female empowerment. <laughs> Hello, Hello, love. <laughs> Hello. Peter and James recruited a third author to their academic publishing sting. A feminist historian they referred to as the Oracle. Hello. Hello. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Helen has a remarkable ability. When most people read something or try to learn something and they're like, wow, this is bullshit, they'll just stop instantly. <laughs> but not Helen. <laughs> Helen. <laughs> Helen will do something extraordinary. She will keep learning about it and keep reading it and keep digging down in it. And it's, it's absolutely remarkable. So why do you know so much about it, but you're not of it? Well, I had to study literary theory for, for several years as part of studying literature, but I, I just became interested in it. it it's such a counterintuitive and sort of complicated on the surface, but underneath quite simple 
um, ideology, framework for, for belief. And that's what's, what's always interested me. I studied religion because I was interested in how these very complex systems of thought um, that are internally consistent but need not actually have any basis in reality, how they can spread and how they can be used for different purposes and, and build on themselves and grow. And this is something that we're seeing with postmodernism and um, sort of it, it, its successes within sort of social justice. What, what are they building? What, what is this thing? Because there's, there's reams and reams and reams of scholarship. And no, so it's upside down world. There's reams and reams of this stuff. What, what is it? They are building a new culture and social... They're building a new cultural and social reality. And the goal is to foist that upon you. It, it is. It's, it's something like a cult or like a religion or something that is based in kind of broken social science. Yeah, it's pretty full on. It's the truth. They're religious fucking maniacs. All right, so this is the foyer. Got a lot of China stuff. This is my wife's office, and that's kind of her sacred place, so don't go in there. This is the kitchen. That's Teddy. Here's the fridge. Help yourself. Recycling trash. No fat goes in the recycling. There's coffee every morning right there. Here's where we eat dinner every night. That's the table. Those are my, my grandparents. They fled the Armenian massacre. We usually have a lot of Chinese people living here, so if you run into them, they don't really speak English. Just say hello and wave, and they'll wave back. Okay, here's TV room. We have Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. You just put the TV on and just put what you want, and it's you can figure it out. So my son isn't living in China now. You can have his bedroom. These are narrow stairs, be careful. This is my, my daughter's room. She makes me ring the bell every time I want to go in. In his room, in his bed, make yourself at home. Uh, there's his bed, he got it from Costco, very comfortable, or uh, Ikea, very comfortable. Um, yeah. Richard Baldwin is a retired professor who donated his identity to the project. This way the team had real academic credentials to submit their papers with. I was uh, bringing um, speakers to the college and so I chose him and I, I wrote him and he agreed to do it and I got him there and we just bonded immediately because immediately, like it that. was like we could tell each other everything. Yeah. I mean we we trusted each other for some reason yeah. from the, the first time we met. It's like we hit it off, we, we sense in each other an honesty, a belief in truth, and, and uh, somehow, I almost felt like we had met in another lifetime. It almost made me believe in reincarnation because we clicked immediately. And so even after uh, he left, after we had a great time, we've, we kept in touch, and that was three years ago, but we've kept in touch emailing or, or uh, texting. texting, stuff like that. He's clean. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not. One look at me and that would be an instantly torpedo and they would know. And it was, I couldn't manufacture a fake name or a fake identity and so he was perfect. Because, and then I, de yeah, go ahead. And then I defriended him on Facebook and I em eliminated all of our social media contacts so that no one would connect us. They decided to start off by coming up with a research paper about social justice bodybuilding. How about pornography? Yeah, we could talk about pornography for sure. Because if yeah. you go online, you can find female bodybuilding porn. I'll take, I'll take your word for it, but that, so that right there is a, is a hook. So now well, Denise Messino is a former competitor, and she, everybody in the bodybuilding world knows that she's done all that stuff. She, tons of... of What's uh, her name? Denise Messino. Massimo? Massino, M-A-S-S-I-N-O, I think. Oh my holy shit. Oh my gosh, wow, she... See the porn video set? See what I'm talking about? 
and she's got this enormous clip and, and, and enormous um, stuff from all those drugs, and it's like, she's big. Wow, that is just extraordinary. Wow, that's... All right, we're gonna have to use her in this somehow. Oh God, we, so we let's link fat studies in here somehow. Maybe we can make the claim that female bodybuilders should be. Oh God, that's fucking good. Female bodybuilders should be morbidly obese, and there should be instead of um, this unnatural testosterone or whatever drugs, you know, bovine growth hormone or whatever these people take, maybe instead of that, they should be, you know, Twinkies. So it'll be more egalitarian and then middle American women can participate in these body physique shows to help their, with their self-esteem. Now that's a paper right there. Now that, now any rational person who would, they would think that's just totally like that. That's crazy. Like that's an absolutely insane idea. The more ridiculous we can we can be, the more attention it'll get in the media. Mm. Feminist bodybuilding is crazy. Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners are all homosexuals and closeted and want to engage in BDSM sex but can't. It's crazy. It also probably will end up in a decent journal, which is even crazier. <laughs> Mike, you look just... It's a lot. In, just incredulous and overwhelmed, and it's just total disbelief. It's just hard for me to believe that any of this is going to work. Look, I guess you believe based upon the outcome, right? That's what you believe.